Of course, I was out two weeks, so we're going to pick back up in verse, I'm sorry, in chapter 8 here of the book of Daniel. And the, uh, the title to the sermon is The Coming Ruler. The Coming Ruler. And we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about Jesus here. Okay? And uh, you'll see that uh, as we get through our, our sermon this morning. But um, God has been good to us. You know, God could have wrote a Bible. He could have wrote a, a book, and, and you understand God wrote this book. Yeah, you've got to believe that because that is the truth. And you'll either believe it now or you will believe it one day when you face him. But uh, God wrote a book, and that book has got to have value uh, in, in, in our lives, uh, in, in our surroundings. We have got to value the Word of God. God could have wrote it, written it, and He could have just put in there everything that... That um, you know, we would get, we would need to get by day to day, and he did, and he teaches us what his likes are and his dislikes, and and believe me, those are very important because when we follow and, and when we follow Christ uh, as a believer, and we live our lives according to his his uh, his commands, his likes, his dislikes, our lives turn out better. It's not just another way to find something good. It's not. It is the best version of you that you will ever find is in living uh, with a, having a relationship with Jesus Christ, with God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and, and living according to the Scriptures. But the point I'm making here is this. He didn't have to tell us anything about the future. He didn't owe us that. But He does. And as we're going through the last, the second half of, of Daniel especially, the first half of Daniel, chapters 1 through 6, were all about the personal history of Daniel himself. And then the uh, chapter 7 through 12 are, are, are prophetical in nature. It's all about the future. And, uh, and today we'll be looking at another vision that Daniel had. Remember a couple of weeks ago when I got up and I said that my notes were blurry? How many of you remember me saying that? Okay, it's like I have perfect vision now, farsighted. That, those words on the back screen used to be blurry for me. And now they're as clear as day. But it's still blurry up here. So you may see me bring my reading glasses in here eventually. Anyway, I just thought I would share that with you. Uh, it's kind of it's really nice to be able to see who's on the back row. Jackie Coleman, I see you back there. And then Marguerite Myers, I see you back there. And I couldn't do that before. I could not recognize people in the back. So anyhow, uh, well, there you go. That's part of my life. We're going to review really quickly two visions that were given to us, uh, one in chapter 2 of Daniel and then another one in chapter 7 of Daniel. The first one, the last time that I preached in here, I related these two visions together. I'm not going to re-preach it, but we are going to review it for uh, to just kind of remind us of, of what we've already covered here. Nebuchadnezzar's image that he had a vision of in chapter 2. Who was Nebuchadnezzar? He was the uh, king of Babylon. Great and powerful king of the world empire at that time. The entire world, the known world was ruled by Babylon and its king was Nebuchadnezzar. He had a vision and in the vision he saw an image an image, and this image looked like this. The head, it was the image of a man and the head was, was gold, was, you know, was made of gold. The chest and the arms were made of silver. That represented the next world empire that would come on the scene. Given prophecy now. And uh, that represented the Medo-Persian Medo Empire. All right. That would defeat Babylon later on and become the next world empire. The belly uh, was of brass and the thighs were of brass. That represents uh, the Greeks. The Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great that would come, on to power, come into power after the Persians. So you have Babylon. Well, they're going to be conquered by, by uh, Medo-Persia. And then later on, they're going to be conquered by the Greeks. So you have these world powers just coming on one after the other. And this is, what the, this is what this vision looks like. And then the legs, the lower legs are of iron. This represents the Roman Empire that would come on the scene after it would defeat the Grecians, uh, the Greek armies, and would take over control of the world, of the world. And then after that, you have feet 
and toes of clay and iron. Now that represents all the governments since the fall of Rome in like 175 AD, I think. Don't, don't check me on that, but I think that's accurate. All the governments since then, there's not one central power in the world. In other words, we don't rule the world. Right? Russia doesn't rule the world. China doesn't rule the world. We have many countries, many governments, and, uh, and there are obviously some stronger than others. But the, the feet of clay and the ten toes represent that. And we talked about, and that's where we're at now in that part of this vision. Uh, where there's no one worldwide government. The ten toes represent now, and this is something that's in the future to us. Now we're looking at things that, are, that we haven't seen yet. The ten to toes represent ten rulers that will oversee the world one day. Okay? They will oversee the world and they will make room for the, the horn. The Bible says a little horn is going to come up. Uh, amongst those, amongst those ten rulers, or, or the, the ten horns, and uh, it's going to. It's a, oh, actually that's the next vision. The ten toes. Uh, so I'll, I'll explain that in the next vision. So ten toes are the government we have now, and the ten toes represent ten rulers that will reign one day in the future. And then the stone that has been cut without hands is Jesus Christ that will one day return to this world and will put down the Antichrist after the tribulation. And Jesus Christ will rule and reign from this earth in Jerusalem on a throne for a thousand years. Then, now remember that the, the Nebuchadnezzar's dream was how man sees world empires. Man sees world empires as valuable. Man sees world empires as trying to set up the next one. You know, and, 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 uh, and that's the whole, you know, that's the whole problem between, uh, you, you know, Russia and the United States is, you know, Russia and communism, they want to take over the world. Always has been, always will be. And the United States says, no, we don't believe that. We believe in a free world. We believe in democracy uh, around the world. So, um, so. But so, so man is always looking to build a big government, uh, and, and we need less government in our country now, but that's a political statement. I'm really not going to go there today. But um, man promotes this, promotes the things of this image. So man sees governments and empires as powerful and valuable. Now, Daniel's vision in chapter 7, which is uh, a part of last, uh, was the last sermon that we looked at uh, here a couple weeks ago. He has a vision, and it's of four beasts. Okay? Number one is a lion with eagle's wings. And that also is representing Babylon. Right? But when God gave Daniel the vision, all of these kingdoms now are represented by beasts. Because that's the way God sees the kingdoms of men. He sees them as a bunch of hard-hearted, cold people that want power and money and control. And he sees them as wild beasts. God says, I'm not impressed with your government at all. The only government that I'm impressed with is the government of Jesus Christ. And so, so the difference here, Nebuchadnezzar saw... His image, God gave it to him as man would see world empires, powerful and valuable. And then Daniel's vision is as God sees it. And he says, I just see them as animal, animalistic in nature. The first one, lion with the eagle's wings. Okay. Uh, that represents Babylon. The second beast that he saw in, in Daniel chapter 7 was a bear. And that represents Medo-Persia. The third uh, vision that he saw was a leopard that had wings. And that represents uh, the Greeks. And, uh, and I explained what the, you know, these, these beasts and their wings and different things. I explained that last time. And then the fourth beast is not even an animal. It's just a terrible, powerful beast that represents a Roman Empire. And when it came on the scene, it just, it conquered everything. And it conquered everything quickly and soundly and trampled everything in its path. That's why it's represented not even by some animal. Just a, a beast, a great and powerful, terrible beast. Then it also now, so these things were in front of Daniel, okay? And uh, a Roman Empire had not come into power yet. 
And this, the beast of Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 7, not only represents the world, the physical world empire that has come and gone, that came into power, and I think I got these dates wrong. I think it was 175 AD, it came into power. It was like 475 that the Roman Empire went out of power. That's it. Something like that. And so it has come and gone. What Daniel was looking into the future, and he, he would never see it, but what he looked in the future and saw as a Roman Empire, we are now looking in the past, and the history has shown us that Daniel's visions were precise. There are even people that deny that the book of Daniel was written, uh, you know, back in the 6th century. Right? They deny that because they said there's no way that a man could get so precise of a, of a you know, of prophecy. And so they say that's, that's, that's not right. There's no way that could happen. So somebody later on wrote this. You know, somebody later on in the first century A.D. must have written this book and, and just claimed that it was written by Daniel. That's not true. Yeah, man cannot, uh, uh, cannot even see uh, the, the, the future. Man cannot give prophecy without it coming from God. But when God get, tells us something, it's going to be accurate. Amen? It's going to be precise. Amen? It's going to be right, and you can count on it. And uh, this is so precise in these world empires, uh, uh, you, you know, back in the, uh, uh, before Christ, and then the Roman Empire that straddled the coming of Christ. So accurate that there are people that say there's no way a man could have done that. And they're exactly right, because man did do it. Uh, God did it. So this is the, the Daniel's vision. And then uh, the beast had ten horns. Here's where I almost got ahead of myself. The beast had ten horns. Now those ten horns are the same thing as the ten toes in Nebuchadnezzar's beast, uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's image. They represent ten kings that are going to rule the world one day. And, by, and through those ten kings, the Antichrist will come. And the Bible says that he's going to uproot three horns. Meaning he's going to get rid of three and he's going to take the power and become the sole ruler of this world during the tribulation. Okay, that is all in front of us. And the, and the Antichrist is the coming ruler that we're talking about today. The ten horns, the little horn comes in and uproots the three. The little horn comes to power. And under the little horn, the, what is called, what we believe will be the revived Roman Empire will be set up and will rule the world once again under one person, the Antichrist. And that's for a seven year period during the tribulation. And then uh, the Son of Man, the Bible, the Bible speaks of the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7. Um, coming and, and destroying all right, the Antichrist. Now, Daniel 8, so that's chapters 2 and 7 as a review. Daniel 8 finds Daniel having another vision during the third year of Belshazzar. Now, Daniel, okay, so Belshazzar was a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar who was king of what? Oh boy. Everybody say Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon. His grandson, Belshazzar, was the king when the Medo-Persians came and conquered Babylon. Belshazzar, okay, uh, uh, so Daniel is, is, is um, in the first year of King Belshazzar, Daniel had this dream, okay? And, um, no, I'm sorry, boy, I've, 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 I've got this mixed up again. Trust me, I do know this stuff. It must be COVID. It must be that COVID fall going on. Daniel 8. This dream takes, back, it takes place when in the third year of Belshazzar. It says that in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 8. It's the third year of Belshazzar. All right, of Belshazzar's reign. Uh, reign. Daniel is transported in this vision to the future. Not, not physically, but the vision he has, he sees himself now under the Medo-Persian reign. You following me? I know I had a couple hiccups there. I don't want to lose you. 
Bel, uh, uh, under the, the, uh, in year number three of Belshazzar's reign, reign in Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel is there now. You know, the story, the book of Daniel goes back to that point, and he's there, and he has a vision. And this vision is of him years later in Medo Persian, in a city that the Bible calls Shushan. It's the same city of Susa that is where Esther was. Remember Esther in the Bible? That all took place in the Persian capital of, Su of Susa. Well, Shushan is a, just a different name for Susa. Daniel is transported in his vision to Shushan under Medo-Persian rule. All right. And this is what he saw. Number one, we're going to let's read here in uh, verse one of chapter eight in the third year the uh, the reign of king belshazzar a vision appeared unto me even unto me daniel after that which had which appeared unto me at the first and i saw a vision and it came to pass when i saw that i saw shushan that i was at shushan in the palace which is in the province of elam and i saw in a vision and i was by the river Ule. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before me the river and a ram, which had two horns, and two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, not eastward, because it came out of the east, so that the beast might stand before him, so that no beast might stand before him, neither was there any like uh, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand but he did according to his will and became great so Dan in Daniel's vision now in the third year of Belshazzar he's transported to to now the city Shushan by the river Uli under when, when the world is under now Medo-Persian rule he sees a ram the first beast is a ram Interestingly enough, but it makes sense to me, that the ram would become the symbol of the Medo-Persian Empire. The ram had two horns. The first one representing Darius, the king of the Medes, and the second coming up after the first. Right? So one horn came up, the other one came up, and it came up higher than the first. The two, the two horns on this ram's head, that represented Cyrus, king of Persia. Persia. This was the Medo-Persian Empire. They were joined together, and Cyrus, under Cyrus's reign, the the uh, uh, the empire grew and became stronger. That's why the horn was larger, uh, bigger, taller than the first. So Cyrus's horn became more powerful and more prominent uh, in the increase of his power in the empire. The Medo-Persian Empire pushed west, north, and south. As they came out of the east, conquering everything in its path. So, the ba that's the Babylonians. Okay, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, that's the Medo-Persian. That's the Medo-Persian. Has art and the Medo-Persia conquered Babylon. Okay, so we're talking about the Medo-Persian Empire. Daniel's been transported to it in a, in a vision, and he sees this ram. The ram represents Medo-Persia, and it just goes along and it just wipes everybody out. And, and takes control of the world, okay? The second, verses 5 through 7, the second is a goat. And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. He was like a unicorn, had just this huge horn between his eyes. This goat did. And everywhere that this goat went, he just... Wiped everybody out. In other words, and the Bible goes on to say uh, that he, he hit the ram, he destroys the ram, he tramples the ram, and the ram was the Medo-Persian Empire, right? And, he, and the goat, with one horn, tramples the Medo-Persian Empire, and this is a representation of the Greek Empire. Anybody knowing anything about history, who was the, the first and great leader of the, the Greek Empire that, that just destroyed and, and became ruler of the whole earth? Alexander the Great. Exactly right. So this horn on the goat was representative of Alexander the Great. This is the second beast. So God is showing him, now he's kind of breaking down and showing him, Daniel, 
uh, that Medo-Persia now is going to be destroyed by the next world empire being the Greek empire. And, and he's going to go and he's going to give him more information now than the first vision that Daniel had. And he's going to show him that, uh, that, that this one single horn. Of course, Daniel didn't know it was Alexander the Great at the time. God doesn't tell him that. But we know from looking back at history that it was Alexander the Great. And it talks about him. The goat had a single horn representing a single great king. The single horned goat would, uh, would charge the ram and stunningly crush the ram uh, with fury and rage and madness. That's what the word, if you have a King James Bible, it says collar. C-H-O-L-E-R. That's what that means. Fury and rage and madness. The goat's feet touched not the ground, demonstrating the swiftness of his victory. Alexander the Great conquered Medo-Persia in, I think, three years. Just, just went after them and smashed them. And then within the next ten years after that, he conquers the known world. And that's a very, that was a very incredible feat that he accomplished. At the age of 33, Alexander the Great sat down and, and, and his generals came to him and said, We're done. And he said, What do you mean we're done? And he said, well, we've conquered every, there are no more lands to conquer. <clears throat> and the Bible said that Alexander, not the Bible, history teaches us that Alexander, Alexander the Great said, he wept. And wept because it was his, you know, it was done. He, he was not one that could just sit back. He had to always be moving forward and conquering a new land. So... Now, our advantage over Daniel is that he was shown things, as I've already said, the things that would come to pass, things in the future. We are seeing the same events looking back at it in history, and we can define it a little bit better than what Daniel understood it. The vision also speaks of the great horn being broken. Okay, if you read on down there, and this is verses 5 through 7, just for time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the reference and you can read it later. But uh, in verses 5 through 7, it talks about this horned goat and, and runs out and conquers everything, lickety split. You ever used that word? I know you haven't. How many people have used that word? Come on, there we go. There's my seniors. He conquers everything quickly, right? And... Uh, and then the Bible says, the Bible says that the horn is broken. That, that shows that Alexander dies. And he dies in the zenith of his power. His horn is broken and he dies. He dies at the age of 33. All right, and he died. He was a drunkard. He lived a really horrible, vile, ungodly lifestyle. And the lifestyle killed him at the age of 33. All right. So then the, the Grecian Empire, the, the Greeks... Their empire, one king did not follow uh, Alexander the Great. It was divided up among four different generals under Alexander. There was some skirmishing going on and, and whatnot, but it ended up, uh, uh, they divided it up into four uh, different parts, one under each of the generals, of the four generals uh, that were under Alexander the Great. Uh, let's see, he, Alexander the Great, died in 323 B.C. at the age of 33. I told you that. And at the end of his life, he wept. Okay, I'm catching up with myself here in the, here in the, nor in the uh, notes. Now, although I did leave a part out, when the horn, the one single horn broke, four more horns came up. That represents the four generals. And that's, that's secular history, folks. You can, you can look it up and, and, and fact check it this afternoon on your computers. Four generals, and I have the names of them, took over after Alexander the Great died. That's the four horns that came up, okay? Their names, the four generals' names were uh, Cassander, uh, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. All right, now, next in verses 9 through 12... And I'm going to read those because that's we're getting right down to the main point of the sermon. And out of one of them, so out of one of the four horns, out of one of them came forth a little horn. We can see a little horn again, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. The pleasant land being Palestine. Uh, 
And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. And you might say, what in the world does all of that mean? In the third century, in, in two, I don't remember exactly, 246, I don't know, 226, somewhere in there, uh, 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 there, was, uh, there was a man born that was a relative of uh, Seleucid, all right, all right? Uh, one of the four generals. And his name is Antiochus Epiphany, Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes. He comes into power of that one part of the Grecian Empire. Remember, it was divided into how many parts? Four parts. Anti Anti Antiochus Epiphanes came into power under one part, and he, for whatever reasons, he hated the Jews. He hated the people of Palestine, and as he warred, and as he conquered lands, he went into Palestine and persecuted God's people, probably unlike anybody had before. Understand, God's people were not a nation at this time. Under Cyrus... Medo-Persian king, Cyrus had let them go back to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the walls. Remember all of that? Ezra and Nehemiah? So that's already happened. So you have people, uh, you have a Jews living in Palestine again in great number. Antiochus Epiphanes, most likely under the control of Satan, because Satan hates God's people. Antiochus Epiphanes goes in, slaughters upwards of 100,000 Jews, goes into the temple, desecrates the temple, offers a pig, swine. Uh, he, he desecrates the altar and the temple by offering the blood of a pig, sprinkling the blood. In other words, saying this pig is just like Jesus Christ. Well, that's, that's a horrible thing. That's a profane thing to do and to, to profane the, 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 the things of God in that way. This is Anti Antiochus Epiphanes. Hey, to the Jews and came in and wrecked their temple and, <clears throat> and tossed a priest out and, and called himself a priest and offered blood, the pig blood on the altar. All of these things were just throwing it right in the face of God and in the face of Jews, along with murdering upwards of 100,000 Jews. So this is Antiochus Epiphanes. He began a campaign of genocide to wipe out the Jews, desecrating the temple, and, uh, and profaning their God. Now, this lasted 2,300 days. His, his, his involvement there in Jerusalem, persecuting the Jews, lasts 2,300 days. You will find that in Daniel chapter 8 as you read along. 2,300 days represents uh, six years, uh, what is it? six years, four months, and 20 days. Now, after that point, then, then his, you know, Antiochus Epiphanes. Look, that brought on the, the, the Maccabean Revolt. I'm not going into that because we're kind of getting a little bit too deep in some of these areas. I'm probably losing some of you then. That brought on the Maccabean Revolt where the Jews revolted against him. And, uh, and he ended up dying in one, well, I think I have that number somewhere. In the second century, uh, about 150, uh, 150 B.C., now, there's a dual prophecy here, and look, I know I'm going fast, okay? If you're not getting all of this, then go back and watch it again on Facebook. And review it until you get it, because you really do want to get this. And, and I'm sorry for a couple hiccups here, but, uh, but there is a dual prophecy here. Antiochus Epiphanes was a type of the Antichrist. One day when the Antichrist takes over, he is going to rule the world. And he is going to go after God's... He's going to sign a treaty with the Jews, and that will last three and a half years. And it's fake from the get-go for him. He knows that after three and a half years, he's going to come down on the Jews like nobody ever has. And during this time is after the rapture of the church. We're talking about the future now. So Antiochus Epiphanes is a type of the Antichrist that is yet to come. 
Before He comes, before He takes power, the church is going to be raptured out of here. What do you mean? All saved persons are going to heaven. God says, we're out. Antichrist will take over on this earth for a seven-year period. Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, his, his persecution and his reign lasted for 2,300 days, six years, four months, and 20 days. That's almost seven years. That's why that he's looked at as, an, as, as, a, um, as a type of the Antichrist that will come. The Antichrist during the tribulation is a seven-year period on this earth. All believers are already in heaven. We are tri pre-tribulation rapture believers here in this church. And most Baptist churches are. Not all of them, but most are. And we will be in heaven with Christ, and the, and the Antichrist will be on this earth for seven years. The first three and a half years will be peaceful. The last three and, year, uh, three and a half years will be actual, literal hell on earth as he unleashes hell on God's people. A lot of Jews are going to get saved during the tribulation. A lot of people are going to get saved. The Bible says uh, 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 so many will be saved during the tribulation that it will be without number. You won't be able to number them. But they will. you will either, you have two routes in the tribulation. Take the mark of the beast and uh, follow him, and then you'll be <laughs> safe. If you call serving a madman like that safe. Or, if you're a believer, and you deny, and you do not take the mark, you will be killed. Your head will be cut off. And you will go to heaven. But you will suffer that. So Antiochus Epiphanes was a type of the Antichrist. In other words, a picture, a profile picture of the Antichrist that is yet to come. And the Antichrist will rule for how many years down here? Seven years, and his rule will be horrible and terrible on God's people. At the end of that rule, though, Jesus comes back. We come back with him out of, the, out of, out of, the, out of heaven. Clouds are going to part. We're going to come back. Jesus will put down the Antichrist with the word of his mouth. Uh, you're done. There is no battle. A lot of people are like, well, we'll battle God in one day. There's not going to be any battle. God just says, enough and enough, and then there you go. Antichrist is set down to hell for a thousand years, and Jesus Christ will rule for a thousand years here. As Isaac and Joseph and Moses and Aaron and Melchizedek were all types of Jesus, types of Christ in the Old Testament, so too is Antiochus Epiphanes a type of the Antichrist, the coming ruler. The coming ruler. And that's what most of this chapter is about. It's not so much about the ram, it's not so much about the goat, other than the goat, the, the, uh, the, ant, the uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes comes out of the goat and rules and reigns as a picture of the Antichrist one day. And I believe one day sooner rather than what does soon mean in a year? I doubt a year, but I don't know. I can't see us going 10 years. Now that's me. I could be wrong. That's just me. I just can't see us living 10 years. So uh, Valerie and uh, Daniel, you know, if you want to make your mother or grandmother, then, you know, you got 10 years. Antiochus Epiphany died in 164 BC. God's plan will always come to fruition. Always. Cain killed Abel, but God brought Seth through whom the Christ would be born. Pharaoh may order the killing of all baby boys in his attempt to destroy the coming deliverer, but God will save Moses in a, bark, in a, in a small ark on the Nile River and educates him right under Pharaoh's nose at Pharaoh's expense. King Saul may have determined to kill David, but God watches over his own and David becomes king of Israel. Antiochus, the Antichrist, King Herod, Hitler, and all other madmen of the world throughout history and to come in the future may desec desolate the land, <coughs> desecrate the temple, God's sanctuary, and profane God's holy things. But God's word and God's people will remain, and God's plan cannot be undone. 
cannot be undone. I saw this meme on Facebook again. I hate it. It says the devil may be winning now, but God wins in the end. The devil wins only what God allows him to win. God could snuff him out today if he wanted. But God has this grand plan that we don't always understand, do we? But it is going to be accomplished. And nothing can stop God from accomplishing his plan. The enemies of God will come and go along with the Antichrist. And God will remain undefeated with his promises intact and his plan victorious. You'll find that. You'll, you'll, you'll find proof of that here, verses 23 through 25. Now, conclusion. It's 1159. Give me two minutes and I'm done. Conclusion. What should, how does this affect us? Right? You could, you, you could, you could, you could literally sit there and say, yeah, you lost me, you know, on your first hiccup. And I'm sorry for that, but you could say, you lost me. Uh, okay. How does this affect you, though? No, this is very important to know these things so that you know the signs of the, <coughs> the signs of the times and you know what's coming. And God wants you to have peace. God wants you to know the beginning. God wants you to know about the rapture. If you're unsaved today, God wants you to get saved so that you're raptured up out of this world before the Antichrist takes power, before there's a seven years of tribulation, hell on earth here. You don't have to go through any of that. You can watch it from heaven. God does not. But you look, all all believers will be raptured up. Now, if you miss that, and trust me, don't go into the, uh, into the tribulation without Christ. You don't want to miss that rapture. But all those that do will have the opportunity to accept Christ during the tribulation. And, and most, I would say, the, the vast majority of those that get saved during the tribulation will pay for it. They will give their lives if they don't, if they don't, if, you know, you need to take the mark of the beast, the Antichrist will say, I'm not doing it, off with his head. You need to take the mark of the beast, okay, I'll take the mark. In other words, if you go back on God, that's a real problem there. Nevertheless, so what should we, how does this affect you? We should do in light of what we have, well, what should we do in light of what we have learned this morning? Look at verse 27, if you still have your Bible open. And I, Daniel, fainted at the end of the vision. He fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. So what happened? After the vision was over, <coughs> Daniel fainted, and he was sick many days. Well, days for days. I mean, he called into work every day. You know, he texted in to work every day. Hey, I won't be in today because I'm still sick. Well, you might think, well, why was Daniel sick? And then the Bible says, then he rose up and he did the king's business. We need to understand that, that, that the end times are near. And we, as God's people, need to push hard and work hard to the finish line. We need to have a passion for lost souls. Why was Daniel sick? Because God showed him that there's going to be a horrible time under this great ruler, you know, several hundred years from now, Antiochus Epiphanes, and he is going to just persecute God's people to no end. And that bothered Daniel. And then, if you, when we look at that as a dual prophecy, and we see what God is going to do to God's people during the tri tribulation, that should motivate us to witness. Does that make sense? You look. It is. It, it's a look. God's people and God's churches need to get out of their little shells now and stop saying that this is all about me and as long as I'm safe, I'll be okay. No, no. It is our job to take Jesus Christ to our communities. It's our job to take Jesus Christ around this state. It's our job to send missionaries out around the world and even some stateside and support them as they take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We have got to be, a, we have got to be about that. The Bible says, and and I believe that this is the, the play on words here that God meant that when he was when he felt better, he got up and he did the king's business. We need to be about the king's business. We need to rise up 
And we need to have compassion on our fellow man. And if there's somebody in here today that's without Christ, brother, I love you. Brother, sister, I love you. And I don't, look, I'll do anything to bring you to Christ. I'll do anything to introduce you to a loving God and a loving Savior that, that is, look, he's not about, uh, you, you know, if you don't live the way I want you to live, I dislike you, I hate you, <coughs> you can go on to hell anyway. That is not God. God is like, I have done everything. I've given my son, my own son on the cross, that you could spend eternity with me. I want to spend eternity, God says, with you. It's not just you with me. It's that I want you with me. I created you. And if we have compassion on our fellow man, then, then we have got to be motivated to get up and get about the king's business, as Daniel did. We need to have passionate about the cause of Christ. And that's the lesson. That's the, that's the point of the sermon. A lot of great information here. Like I said, go back and read it. Listen to the, I'm serious. Listen to the sermon again. If I lost you, I have no doubt that I lost some people. We're just trying to cover a lot of things in a short period of time. But we need to be like we need to be like Daniel. We need to get sick about unsaved people dying and going to hell. That needs to bother us again. And we need to rise up and do the king's business. So, join us. Maybe you're here from another church. You go back and you join your pastor, and you go back to your pastor and say, "Hey, I, I'm I'm redoubling my efforts." Uh, in the work of God, in the building of the kingdom, knowing what's coming, knowing what's coming. We've seen it. We've been given a vision of it, and we know what's coming, and we need to be about reaching. Look, work for the night is what? Coming. That's what this refers to. Work for the night is coming, uh, because at some point, Daytime will be over. We will be in heaven and there will be no more work for us to do. We need to work now while it's still day and while we're still here and give it our all. Let's pray. If you're here without Christ this morning, uh, every head bowed, every eye closed. I, 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 I beg you, boy, I'd, I'd get on my knees. If, if, if that's what it takes, I'll gladly do that and beg you to come to Christ. Don't live another day without him. We don't know when our number will be called. We don't know when our days will be up, and we need to be ready for that. If you're here today, and you are a believer, you are a Christian, I want you to, to if, if you're not serving and giving it your all, I believe God calls us to the, into the war again today. Suit up. Step into the spiritual war between good and evil. Work. Uh, 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 give your all until your time is done on earth or Jesus uh, raptures us up and out of this thing and pulls us out of this earth. Let's recommit ourselves to the cause of Christ, the greatest cause ever, the cause of Christ. Make a decision today to do more, to give more, to, to partner with God in this work. If you would all stand as the invitation is played.